today's video is going to be a bit different from my usual topics, but I thought I may as well make it anyway because it could be quite useful for people. And that is taking a look at my new phone. So obviously if you've seen my channel before, a lot of my videos are, I would say, more interesting or boring or niche or weird or whatever, however you want to call it. And I don't really look at consumer electronics that often. However, when I do, I quite like being able to, to sort of look at a product and give my opinion as like a general consumer. You know, if you're finding this video through search or recommendations, I'm not a phone guy. I don't collect phones. I don't have thousands of phones. I don't replace my phone every year. I just buy a new phone when I need one or when I kind of fancy a new one and I use it. So I thought it could be quite useful to take a look at my new phone as a sort of per from the perspective of a general phone user and just someone who's buying this phone just to use as their daily driver. So yeah, I won't be going into sort of a massive amount of detail if you want all sorts of test photos and benchmarks and stuff like that. There's going to be better videos out there. But what I thought we'd do is we'd take a look at it, take it out of the box, give my first impressions, give a tour of it, I'll go away and use it a while and I'll kind of give my, my sort of impressions of it. And as you can see here, I've gone for the brand new Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. For the last couple of years, I've been using an S21 Ultra, so I've got it here, and I absolutely love it. Before I got this, I'd never really been a believer in getting flagship phones, you know, flagship, whatever they call them, because a lot of it felt like it was just kind of hyped up and basically, you know, making them almost like expensive designer items, and there definitely is a bit of that. So before getting the S21 Ultra, as I mentioned, I always went for sort of slightly, slightly cheaper phones. So before I had that, I had a Pixel 5. You can kind of see the size difference as well when it picks up feels tiny now. Before the Pixel 5, I had a Huawei Honor 10, which I also made a video on many years ago. Before that, I had a OnePlus 2, back when OnePlus was a cheap brand, not also going for the flagship sort of status. So I've always kind of used cheaper phones. But then when I bought the S21 Ultra, which I bought secondhand, I kind of realised that, well, yes, you are paying a lot more than you really need to. They do have a lot, things like, the, there's a lot of nice features, things like the cameras are a big upgrade. Now, obviously when I bought this, I bought it second hand, and I kind of have a thing where I don't want to start spending over, over a thousand pounds on a phone. So when I saw the base model RRP of the S23 Ultra being £1,249, I decided I was going to wait a little bit and maybe buy it second hand when the prices dropped because I wasn't going to pay that much for a phone. However, through using Samsung's trade-in service, a couple of voucher codes and cash back, all in, I'll have paid this, paid £829 or so for this, which seems like a stupidly good deal. So I won't ramble about that now because people always get upset if I don't open the box quickly. But what I'll do towards the end of the video is I'll do a section explaining how I got it for that price because at £1,249, yeah, I wouldn't want to spend that on a phone. And personally, I like buying my phones outright. I don't like buying them on contracts. But getting this for £829 is actually quite a good deal. So yeah, here we have it. So this is the base model I went for which has 256 gigs of storage and eight gigs of RAM. They also have a 512 gig model and a one terabyte model. Both those have 12 gigs of RAM. Now, interestingly, the S21 Ultra had 12 gigs of RAM as the base model, which is what this has, and the higher storage models had 16 gigs, but I don't think it's really gonna be an issue. I feel things like RAM on phones, it's, it's to make people buy the more expensive models or to show off and compare to Apple who have like, oh, they don't have enough RAM when it's, entirely down software optimization, you don't need that much RAM. So I feel a lot of the software, the RAM isn't really an issue, so eight gigs should be more than enough. But the big thing with this is that they've upped the base model storage from 128 gig to 256. And that will be a big benefit to me because this phone is kind of permanently full and I'm constantly trying to delete stuff and move stuff off it and it's getting really annoying. And since in, 20, since, since in the S21 Ultra and future models, they removed the SD card slot that used to be in the previous ones, I kind of need to keep have more base storage, so 256 will be a nice upgrade. So what we'll do is we'll take out the box first and then I'll go in and sort of explain some more stuff about it, but if we try and open this up. I'm really excited to see this. Also in terms of colour, um, I went for the graphite one. Now you'll see on the front of the box it kind of shows these three colours, so it shows the sort of blue one, the green one, the red, and I think they call it lime, and graphite. Now, apparently, according to the website, those are like pre-release colours. Now, I didn't pre-order these, but when I went on the website, it listed it as um, pre-order colours now available from stock. So I suspect they obviously had like limited edition pre-order colours and then didn't sell enough of them and then made them available. So I went, I got one of the pre-order colours. So I don't know if this box is maybe like a limited one for the pre-order colours. As standard, it's things like, fan you get things like phantom black, green, a sort of different bluey colour, those kinds of colours. Um, but I went for the graphite pre-order colour, which I'm really excited to see in person or nervous to see in person because 
when I was looking at it online, I looked at the colours and I kind of liked the graphite one, but I wasn't that sure. And I kept thinking, no, I'll just go for Phantom Black, I'll go for Phantom Black. And I then watched a bunch of videos on the graphite and thought, yeah, still not sure, not a big fan of it. But then I went and looked at the Phantom Black and went, now I've been looking at graphite for ages, that looks boring. So I caved and went for the graphite. I was also really tempted to go for the red one, but as far as I can tell, I would really need to go and see one in person. It looks almost like a sort of orangey salmon colour. It doesn't look like a sort of bright red, so I didn't really want it, which is a shame because the red would look absolutely amazing if it was a bit more red, not orange. But yeah, this is going to be my genuine first impressions of the graphite colour because I have no idea what to expect here. So, oh, that's, oh, there we go. And there we go, so that's come off and that's it there. And actually, yeah, that looks really nice. Um, I would have preferred it to be more of a dark grey rather than such a light grey, but it does look pretty cool. That is quite nice. So it's the graphite on the black on the back and then the sides are just black like you would get on Phantom Black. So yeah, that does look quite nice, actually. So yeah, here we have the phone. I've just blanked out the IMEI numbers on the back, so that's why there's a jump cut on my other tape on the back of it now. But yep, yeah, as for my first impressions, it feels pretty good. It's about the same size as the old one, so I'm not too worried. I realistically would not want to go any bigger than this kind of phone. Now, I know I've said that every time I've bought a phone. For example, when I bought the OnePlus 2, I said I was never going to go bigger than that. And then when I bought the Huawei, I was never going to go bigger than that. And then, you know, I've, apart from the Pixel, I think it's slightly smaller. I've kind of gone bigger every time. So who knows? <laughs> I may go for a bigger phone in the future, but I didn't really want to go much bigger than this. So it's nice to see it's about the same size. So what I'll do before we compare it anymore is I'll just take the all the protective stuff off. So this will be satisfying. Now, in terms of design, they haven't really changed much over the previous S22 Ultra, as far as I can tell. Looking online, apparently they've slightly squared it off. Now, I don't have one here to compare to, but they've slightly squared off the edges. They've reduced the curvature at the side of the screen, but not much more than that. But I've taken it off the front, and there's also a sort of plastic film around the side. That comes off there. Oops, everywhere. There's only one side. That's no, more than the side. So let's get all this off. Don't know why I'm filming this, but equally it's quite satisfying peeling stuff, so I may as well. If it actually... There we go. Now, interesting inside of that is actually a kind of matte finish. That's really nice. I don't know if that's the same on the Phantom Black, because it looks kind of glossy when it's got the protective stuff on. But when you peel it off, it is actually matte black underneath, which is kind of nice. Now, I'm going to keep this in a case. I know lots of people nowadays will not put phones in a case, but... I'm clumsy and this is very expensive and I don't want to risk damaging it. So unfortunately I'm probably not going to see that because it'll be in a case, but that is really, really nice, that sort of matte finish. Wasn't expecting that, I thought it'd be more glossy. But yep, if we finally get that off there, we'll take a look at it and compare it to the S21 Ultra. So that's it there, get all that stuff out of the way. And if we compare it to the older phone, you can definitely see the curvature on the edge has been flattened out quite a bit. They're both still, they both still have curved edges, but it is a lot less pronounced on the S23 Ultra than on the S21 Ultra, which is quite nice. And also if you just compare the overall form factor, the corners are squared off a lot, the edges are a lot flatter. They've basically squared it off a lot, which in terms of my personal preference, I much prefer. I'm, I'm, I much prefer sort of more flat edges and squared off corners than sort of round stuff like this. The other change I've done is the camera bump, whereas on this one it was more of a single piece. This one, it's individual lenses. I do really like this style um, compared to this one, but actually it's probably fine. I suppose the only thing to be careful of is if you're laying that on the table, you are going to lay it on the cameras, but I'm sure they've thought about that and protected them sufficiently around the edges. So yeah, in terms of the overall style, it's about the same size, weight feels basically the same between the two of them it's just this one's a bit more squared off so it possibly looks slightly bigger top down because it's not got the curved edges but yeah I really like how this looks that looks really good so yeah what I'll do is quickly turn it on on camera for the first time but then I'll go away set it up do all that off camera and I'll come back and give my actual impressions on it see that's starting up there 
Now, the other notable thing, and this has been Samsung for a few different generations, there's no charger in the box, you'll have noticed. It's just, if you own that, oh, there's more accessories. These were probably meant to come out on top of the phone and got stuck in the box. So, you'll notice that there are some accessories, but there is no charger. So you get a SIM removal tool, that makes sense to have, a sort of manual, and a USB-C to USB-C cable, which is the slightly cheaper type where it's not actually extruded, it's just, you can see the crimping where it's been bent round. That's not as nice, but it's just a USB-C cable. But yeah, like Apple, they no longer include chargers with their phones, which to, for, to me is annoying because while yes, they're claiming it's some sort of saving the environment thing, I do wonder when they're do making phones with non-replaceable parts and all this sort of stuff, if the environment is really the consideration here. And while it is true that lots of people will have chargers lying around, I do worry about people buying phones who will happily spend you know more than the grand on a phone, but then they'll go out and buy the cheapest charger they can find to charge it, and end up either blowing up their phone or having causing fires and all this sort of stuff. So I would definitely say obviously it doesn't come with a charger. You'll need to buy one if you don't have one already, but just don't buy a super cheap one. And one thing to bear in mind with Samsung phones that's caught me out before is if you want to use the super fast charging that these offer, you need to buy a charger that supports PPS. You can buy a charger that supports things like Qualcomm Quick Charge and USB power delivery, but none of those will necessarily support PPS, which is what Samsung requires. So if you're buying a charger, make sure it explicitly states that it supports PPS charging if you want to do super fast charging. And in particular, the S23 Ultra can super fast charge up to 45 watts. So if you want to get the full charging speed out of it, you'd want to buy a PPS charger that's at least um, 45 watts output. So that's just something quite important to bear in mind. Personally, I use a couple of Ugreen chargers. I've got a 100 watt one beside the bed, which has a USB-C cable to either side of the bed. And that's great because it can fast charge phones and it can also power my laptop, which is good. And then in the living room, I've got a 140 watt Ugreen one, which has a USB-C cable for phones and a MagSafe cable connected so I can do the full 140 watt charging of my laptop. And they'll all do fast charging and PPS for these Samsung phones. Now, in terms of the battery lifespan, I don't really like always supercharging my phone or super fast charging. So what I do is I turn off super fast charging, do normal slow charges overnight. But if I need to charge the phone up quickly, say I'm needing to charge it and I'm about to go out and I need to urgently charge it quickly, I'll enable super fast charging. But yeah, that was just a quick aside there. Doesn't include a charger. You'll need to buy one if you don't have one already. And if you want to super fast charge, it needs to support, P it needs to support PPS. But anyway, so that's now the initial setup wizard going on there. Oh, we need to put a SIM card in it. Forgot about that. So yep. I'll go ahead and do this off camera and I'll get it set up. But yeah, I'll also need to put a SIM card in, which will be on the bottom. And like on old phones, they put it right next to the microphone, so you want to be careful and not stick the SIM removal tool into the microphone. I looked up and apparently they've, they've protected against people doing that, but I don't trust my ability to not be an idiot and break things. So yeah, we'll try and me be an idiot and break things and then drops the phone. Um, I'll try and not stick the SIM removal tool into the microphone. So there we go, put that in there and that'll come out. And I presume it's dual SIM. Uh, yep, so like the old one, it is dual SIM. So you have a SIM on each side you can put in. So that's quite nice to have. I still wish it did include an SD card reader. That would be quite nice to have, but oh well, it is at least dual SIM. So yeah, I'll get my SIM in there, get it set up and we'll come back with my sort of impressions. And we're back. So I've now used the phone for a couple of days so I can kind of talk about it. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail and show loads of stuff. If you want to get like proper performance tests and proper example photos and stuff, there's going to be better videos out there. But I've used it a bit, got a bit of experience, so I can kind of talk about it. So what do I think? I absolutely love it. And it definitely feels like a nice upgrade over my S21 Ultra. Now it is not a huge revelation. It's not game changing. It's not making this thing absolutely irrelevant and now this is the best phone in the world. It just feels like a nice incremental improvement. Not really much more than that. It's a nice bit better, a bit faster, a bit nicer performance, a few nice new features, but it's not like the like game changing. But let's talk about it. So if we shift that out of the way, the first thing to talk about is sort of form factor. So obviously, as I mentioned, the sort of design is a bit different. You can see obviously I've got it in a case now. I would love to use it without a case, but I do not want to destroy my phone. So I've got it in a case. This is a Spigen Ultra Hybrid, I think. I'll just get, I'll just get it up. Uh, yeah, a Spigen Ultra Hybrid. I'll put a link in the description. 
I don't really care about cases, but it's quite nice. It's got a clear back so you can kind of see the design on the back of the phone, which is good. If you put like stickers on the phone or whatever, or anything really, you can see it through the case, which is nice. So it is in the case, that makes it a little bit bulkier. And also there is a screen protector on this now, so if you're seeing fingerprints or any scratches or reflectivity of the screen, don't judge the phone by that. It does have a screen protector on it. But in terms of the form factor, as I mentioned, because it's got the more flat shape, it does make it a little bit bulkier than the S21 Ultra. Just because the rounded corners and more rounded edges made it a little, feel a little bit smaller and thinner in the hand. But it's not too bad. It does still fit into any pockets or anything I needed to carry it in. It's a bit tighter than the old one, but it st still fits and it's perfectly usable, which is good. And I think personally, I much prefer this look. Generally, I do prefer boxier, more angular things. And this phone is a bit more rounded than I'd really like. So I do really sort of like this change. And especially the slightly flatter screen's nice. This one does really taper off towards the edges, whereas this one's a, it does still have curved edges, but it's not as pronounced. It'll also be interesting to see how that affects screen protectors. Because historically, putting screen protectors on the ones with more curved edges, they do stick okay, but I do sometimes find they start coming up at the edges. So potentially having less curvature might help with that. I just need to see. But yeah, I really like the style of this. It's a really, really nice phone. Next up, when it comes to performance, what do I think? Well, it performs absolutely brilliantly. Now, interestingly comparing this to my old phone, it's not significantly quicker. You know, it, it's not like some of the demos you'll see people do where they'll click an app on both the phones and they'll, this one will load instantly, this one will take ages or web pages. I sat for a while sort of launching apps or launching web pages by having both phones up and clicking the button at the same time. And they were kind of the same. There was there was a huge improvement, but equally this phone is already really, really fast. So it's not really a problem. It's just, you know, you can't really get faster than a fraction of a second to open an app, for example. But where I have noticed the performance is generally animations can feel a little bit smoother. And in particular with the camera, when you take a photo and then on these, on these Samsung phones, you take a photo, you then go to view it, and then it'll show a little spinning thing at the top while it's processing the photo. So usually if you take a photo and immediately go to preview it, it'll look a bit rubbish, take a little second processing, and then it'll show it. And that is quite a bit faster on this phone. Especially with like low light photos and stuff, if you take them on this phone, you do kind of have to wait a while. Like say if I've taken a photo in like a nightclub or outside and you want to go and show someone it, you're kind of looking at this like really blurry, rubbish photo and it takes like a good few seconds on this phone to kind of actually process it and show the proper one. This one still has a delay, but it is a lot, lot like quite a bit quicker. Speaking of the camera, I am very impressed with it. Again, it feels like more like a sort of incremental improvement rather than a game changing one, but it is really good. So like, you know, the previous phone, I may as well show it for people that haven't seen these phones before. You've got the ultra wide, you've got a one time zoom, a three time zoom and a 10 time zoom. Those are all optical zooms. And obviously you can zoom in between. You can do this ridiculous hundred times zoom, which essentially is a digital 10 times zoom on the 10 times optical lens. I never really use a digital zoom, but these optical zooms are extremely useful and I use them all the time, especially this 10 times one. It can be nice if you want to take something, a photo of something from afar, obviously. But even for things like, in say like when I'm working, I need to like read a serial number or an IP address off a networking device that's halfway up a wall. Actually, sometimes being able to zoom in can mean I can do that without having to get a ladder out. It's actually quite useful for that. And in particular, I've used that on this phone quite a lot. So yeah, the zoom, as superfluous as it is having that many camera lenses, I actually really like it. I think it's really useful. The other thing that's useful to note with these phones is with this six times optical zoom, or sorry, sorry, 0.6 times wide angle lens, it also works as like a macro lens. So if you want to take a really up close photo of something, if you put it onto the wide angle setting and then bring something in, you can get super, super close with it. Like, it's not a microscope obviously, but it's kind of close. I've used this quite extensively on my old phone for things like getting part numbers off chips on circuit boards or looking at circuit boards closely. This can be really, really good for that. So. I'll, send, I'll put an example photo up that I've taken just to show the kind of effect. Yeah, the, the wide angle lens is also really good for up close macro shots. Now in terms of performance between this and the old phone, obviously I mentioned it processes photos faster. And the photos, especially in low light, are a lot better and especially with video. Video looks a lot better in low light, which is quite important to have. So that's actually one of the improvements I've made with this camera, is the main camera is now a 200 megapixel camera, whereas in the old camera it was a 108 megapixel camera. Now that on paper sounds stupid, 
And I think a lot of it does seem to be so people can show off and go, oh, well, look, your iPhone's only got a normal resolution camera. I've got 200 megapixel. Really, who cares? But what Samsung do with this is while you can technically take a 200 megapixel picture, you never would really want to do that because it just takes up so much storage space. And let's face it, the optics on this aren't going to be good enough to really take advantage of that. But what it does do is what's called pixel binning. So traditionally, when you take a photo on this, it'll be a 12 megapixel photo. But what it's doing is it's grouping groups of pixels together and almost using them as one pixel. And by doing that, it can, it can deal better with low light because it can get more light in and it can reduce noise because it's taking information from multiple pixels. And by going from a, almost doubling the sensor resolution means they've doubled the number of pixels in each bin. So that can help with low light performance. What they've also introduced on this is a 50 megapixel mode. So that still uses the pixel binning but obviously with less pixels, so you'll get a bit more noise and a bit less lower light performance, but that gives a 50 megapixel output, which is kind of a good balance between super high resolution, but also not taking up half your storage. As with other lenses, the three times and 10 times optical zooms are each 10 megapixel, and the ultra wide and macro lens is 12 megapixel. So resolution wise, they're all pretty good. The main one seems excessive, but it's because of that pixel binning, and that really does help with low light performance, which is really good. The other thing that massively improved on this is stabilization when it comes to video. So you can switch off into video mode and obviously currently it just gives you the wide angle one times, three times, 10 times lenses. But if you enable stabilization up here, it only then gives you the option of the wide angle lens and the one times lens. But what you'll notice is when stabilization is enabled, it massively crops in the video. So you can, you to get a sort of similar effect, you'd probably to the one times lens normally, you can put it on stabilization and use the ultra wide angle lens, which gives a similar field of view. But because there's so much picture that's not in frame here, it can use that to stabilize the image. And it is seriously impressive. It's almost sort of gimbal level. It's really, really good. And it is a lot better than the old phone. This has a similar feature, but on this, you see a little bit more distortion or blurring or weird sort of edges on things when you're panning and stuff. This just seems to be a bit more responsive, be processing a bit more, more accurately so you do definitely get much better steady shots. So that's really, really good to have. I really like that. I think the only real complaint I would have with the camera, and it's something I've seen a few people reporting online, is the pictures can look a bit sharp. And that would normally sound a good thing. Oh, the camera's really sharp. But when I say sharp, I more mean sharpened. I noticed this particularly this week, I was taking a photo of a server rack because that's what I do because I'm sad. I mean, I needed it for documentation. And I just look back at, back at the photo afterwards and the, because it's a, a server at such a big thing with lots of text and angles and sharp lines, you could kind of see how overly sharpened some of the edges looked. It's similar if you're taking a picture of, say, like a brick wall where there's lots of defined edges or a building where, again, there's lots of like edges around, a, around windows and stuff like that. It can just look a bit overly sharp. The best example would be if I show a couple of photos that I took between this phone, the S23 Ultra and my S21 Ultra, they're not exciting photos just of my own server rack and a hard drive just because of the things I had to hand. But if you compare them, from afar they kind of look similar and potentially you could almost say the S21 or S23 Ultra does look a bit sharper. But when you zoom in close and look at the more fine details, to me it looks like the sharpening adjustment that you would use in post, like when you're editing a photo, the sharpening has been cranked up a bit too high. Now it's fine, but I would have rather that was a little bit reduced. Sharpening that image can make sense. In fact, on my YouTube thumbnails, generally speaking, I've massively cranked the sharpness because it makes them look a lot better when they're shrunk down small. But on my photos, I would rather the sharpness wasn't there at the start. And if I wanted it, I could add it in later. It's not the end of the world. And it's probably something that could be resolved with an update if there's enough people having a problem with it. Oops, I've just, hello, that's me. Just flip the camera. Um, it's something that I wouldn't either could possibly be fixed in, in software updates if it was that much of a problem, but it is something I've noticed that the pictures could almost look a bit artificially sharpened on it. Now, this does kind of come down to how Samsung do their cameras, and it's just a difference with Samsung versus, say, Google on the Pixel phones. There's a Pixel for reference, just for no reason. What I generally find on Pixel phones is the cameras are more real life. So if you take a photo on a pixel, it'll look very realistic. It'll look like what you saw in person. 
whereas Samsung phones tend to do a lot of post-production and optimization and changes to the photos. So if you take a photo out of a Pixel, it will look good and it will look very accurate. If you take a photo out of a Samsung, it will look a bit brighter and a bit more saturated. But it's the sort of thing if you were to show the photos to someone and say which looks better, they'll probably pick the one from the Samsung because it's a bit more vibrant and a bit more processed, but it's not as authentic to real life. So if you wanted to do like accurate real life photography, I mean, use a camera, but if you want to do more accurate real to life stuff, something like a Pixel is probably a better option for you. But for me, where most of my photos are just taken on a phone, sent to people, posted on social media, stuff like that, without any editing, and I don't want to mess about with that, the Samsung does give quite nice outputs just by doing all that post-processing that they do. But yeah, that sharpening is a little bit weird, and it just seems a bit a bit too, too intense on this. But I can absolutely live with it. And the low-light performance more than makes up for that, because I obviously take a lot of photos in low-light situations. This is much better than the old phone. So that was a bit of a ramble about the camera, but what else is there? Well, the other thing that kind of surprised me with this is the quality of the speaker. Now, obviously the quality of a phone speaker isn't the biggest deal in the world, and you're probably not going to be using it a lot. You know, you're not going to use a phone speaker if you want good quality music. And let's face it, it's not 2007 where blasting bass hunter out your phone on the back of the bus was normal. So it's not as big a deal as it, you know, could be. But I do sometimes use a phone speaker. Say, for example, if I'm in the shower, I've got a sort of phone holder in the shower that I can just stick my phone in and put some music on. So I do use a phone speaker in that. Or say, if I'm just working somewhere where I've not got a, any other device, I'm, I've just all I've got my phone and I want some music on, I don't want earphones in, I might use the speaker. And the speaker on this is noticeably better than on the old phone. It's still not amazing. It's not remotely comparable to you know, even a lot of laptop speakers nowadays, but it is a lot better. So I'll put a little sort of quality test up. You'll, we'll see if you can actually tell the difference. I don't know how good it'll come across, but it just seems to have a fair bit more bass. The highs can be a little bit harsh, but let's face it, it's a phone speaker. It's going to be a bit tinny, but it does have quite a bit more bass than the old phone. So yeah, the built-in speaker is a nice improvement. So we'll quickly do a sort of audio test comparison between them. So we'll go through that now and see, see what you think. It still doesn't sound amazing. It is a phone, but Let's listen to it and see how it compares. Now the final thing to talk about on this is the S Pen. Now this is something that I knew it had when I bought it and then totally forgot it had when it arrived and then sort of spotted it and went oh yeah it's got that doesn't it? Because this has the built-in S Pen. So what I hadn't realised is that Samsung seem to have actually killed their Note line off, line up. They don't do note, Samsung Notes anymore. And what they've then done is they've put the S Pen into the Galaxy line. Which made sense because it was this weird sort of thing where you'd have to buy the Note phone if you wanted the pen but then they were making kind of two phones that were very much very similar apart from the note coming with a pen. So it does make sense that they've kind of combined them now into one phone. My, my S21 Ultra does actually support an S Pen. In fact, this S Pen works on it. 
but it doesn't have any way to hold it and it doesn't come with one. So with this phone, if you wanted to use the S Pen, you'd have to buy one separately and then you need to get a sort of special case from Samsung that had a slot to put it in and then that would make the phone a lot bulkier. So of course I never bothered. And it's not something I would ever want to really pay a lot extra for and then have a case that was a compromise to carry it. But having this built into the phone is actually really nice. Now it's a very niche use case. Of course you can just use it just to literally use the phone as normal as if it's your finger, which I've played with a little bit, it's not really that useful. But it does have a bit of a use. Now of course you see people using these to sort of write shopping lists and stuff like that. I'm not going to do that. Like if you look at the notes I've written for this video, my handwriting is absolutely dreadful and borderline unreadable. I mean I literally write things down and come back and can't read it. So I'm not going to write a list because it'll probably be harder for me to read and take me longer to write than if I was typing it. But I can still see myself actually using this. Say for example I want to quickly sketch something. So see I can open up notes and I can just create a note in here and you can now sketch stuff with it. Obviously that's how it works. But say for example like quite often I end up having to help someone out with something, be it a technical thing or a DIY thing or something like that. And sometimes be able to quickly sketch what I'm meaning about, oh, you know, where you've got a wall here and a beam here, do this. The number of times I've done that and I've ended up just having to scratch, sketch it down on a bit of paper and then send them a photo of that paper. So being able to just do that sort of thing on a phone with the pen is quite useful. So just quick little diagrams or whatever, it's going to be useful for that. Another situation I can find that's actually very useful and I will actually definitely use it for is things like marking up photos. So say I've got an example photo of a hard drive. And say I needed to send this somewhere, I needed to edit it. Now obviously I'm not going to be doing much. Say, say I want to either circle something, so I want to say, oh you need to give me the number that's here. Being able to actually use this with the pen and actually mark up the photo like that, presumably with a less thick line, is really useful because obviously I've done this a lot with my old phone, but all I would end up doing is just having to use the use my finger on the screen and that's really fiddly and you never quite get it right. So actually having a pen that you can be super accurate with is really really nice so I can definitely see myself using that. Additionally for things like redacting photos you know you send the photo of something you need to like take a serial number or like a name and address or a phone number out of it again being able to do that and carefully redact stuff without having to use your finger and try and carefully line it up you can be a lot more precise with this which is actually really quite nice and it's something I, it's something that I don't think I'll use loads but I can definitely see myself using this. I wouldn't pay a lot extra for a phone that had this over one that didn't but I can see myself using this quite a lot, quite a bit, just for little things like this. But I'm definitely going to be doing handwritten notes. Of course, there's a bunch of other stuff it does, like it'll you can do a sort of augmented reality thing where you get a, you look at the room and through the camera, and you can draw three D objects in space. It was a fun novelty for five minutes, but I don't know why I'd ever use that or what people would ever use that for. So if, if anyone knows what that sort of stuff's useful for, feel free to tell me because I don't have a clue. But I do actually see this being something I might use a little bit. There's also nice little features like if you leave this out the phone and then turn the phone off. Oh, I just dismissed it there. But if that's out the phone and you turn the phone off, it actually pops up saying got your S Pen so it knows that the pen's outside the phone and shouts at you telling you to put it in so you don't leave it out which is good. My only fear with the S Pen, which is entirely a me problem, is that I am really bad for fiddling with things. And this is an absolutely brilliant fidget toy because you can pull out the phone, you can click the end of it, all that sort of stuff. So I am now worried how long it will be before I end up breaking this because I am the murderer of pens. If someone gives me a pen, it will be destroyed in a week because I'll just fiddle with it and break it. So this is my only fear with this is I'm going to be fiddling with this quite a bit and I'm worried that I might break it. So hopefully not. I want to somehow take it out with the screen off and now it's given me the option to draw and do notes. That's weird. Anyway, but yeah, the S Pen, wasn't really thinking I would use it, definitely wouldn't pay extra for it, but it is really nice to have there and I have used it a few times. Okay, so this is just me jumping in while editing at the end just to talk about how I got it for such a cheap price because I completely forgot to say that when I was filming it, I can't be bothered setting the camera up again. But I've mentioned throughout the video that I used their trading offer. Now, previously I've never bothered trading in phones because I've always seen that it's just, you know, you're trading it in and you're getting way less than the value that you could sell it for. So I've always never bothered. But when I saw the offer, I thought, oh, I'll go on, let's have a laugh and see how little they'll offer for my old phone. And then in terms of my S21 Ultra, I 
don't really want to sell that anyway. And I also couldn't really sell that because I bought it second hand and it seems I've had a couple of parts replaced. I mean, it's perfectly fine, but I wouldn't want to risk trading it in somewhere and then have them come back going, oh no, you've got non-original parts or parts have been changed in here. So for a laugh, I took a look at my old Pixel 5 because when I got the S21 Ultra, I took the old Pixel 5 in a drawer and never really thought about it because at the time looking to sell it, I was going to get about £200 and nowadays you'd probably only be able to sell it for about 120 It was worth having that just as a spare phone for that amount of money. So I came on the Samsung website and thought, oh, let's see for a laugh how much will they offer me for a Pixel 5. So I went to Google, Pixel 5, and still they were offering me £240. Now, given you can go on eBay right now and buy a Pixel 5 for, 150, for under £150, that just seemed a bit mad. So I thought, well, that's a pretty good deal. So, of course, I, I went for that, continued with that. Then, of course, here you have to say whether it's in good condition, but it's literally just it turns on and has normal wear and tear, so that's not really a problem at all. And my one's basically in perfect condition, so I continue to that. And then we just put the IMEI in. Now, unfortunately, I can't do this and demonstrate it on camera because I've, it's saying my IMEI has already been used because I've already put it in for a trade-in. But you put the IMEI in and then it adds the trade into your basket. So that would give me, give me £240 off, which already was pretty good. But then I saw this thing here. It said, get up to 750 off when you trade in and use code S23BOOST. So then in the basket, after this part here where you've picked all the options, you enter the offer code S23BOOST. And, and that gives an extra £150 off. So this seems to be a voucher code that if you trade in, you can then use this voucher code to get an extra £150 off. So I've put a photo up that I took when I was at the cart page, just in case it didn't work. But you can see here that it's given me £240 off for the Pixel 5, which is listing as £90 trade-in value plus £150 extra trade-in value. And then it gives an additional £150 off with the S23 Boost voucher code. So that gave me the £390 off for trading in an old Pixel 5, which seemed ridiculously worth it, so I did it. And on top of that, it's also worth mentioning that Samsung are on often on sites like Top Cashback and Quidco. So I used the Top Cashback offer here, which gave 4.25% cashback. I've put a um, referral link for Top Cashback in the description, so if you do use that, I do get a small kickback from it. But if you've not used Top Cashback or Quidco, they're definitely worth using, not just for Samsung, but for loads of other things as well. And yep, you get 4.25% cashback through Top Cashback. Of course, these offers change, but currently that's a value. Additionally, if you have any sort of credit card or even debit card that offers cashback rewards on certain retailers, things like American Express, Barclay Card, I'm sure Virgin Money do it, RBS do it on some of them, check those offers as well. Because often Samsung is on those. At the time that I purchased this, the only offers listed there were for in-store purchases. So I didn't end up doing that and I ended up just using getting an extra 1% cash back through Amex. However, if you're planning on buying a Samsung phone in a physical store, definitely look at those because I think Amex was offering, I think, 10% cash back if you spent more than a thousand pounds. Barclay Card was offering about 7% if you're spending more than I think 500 or something. So that seemed very worth it. In fact, I actually popped into the store to see if they would be able to do the trade-in deal in store because if they could match the online trade-in deal and then give me the cash back through my credit card as well, that would be even more worth it. So I went into the store and they were like, oh yeah, we can do the trade-in, did the trade-in, calculated the value and came up with a value of £288, which still isn't a bad deal. But at that point I was like, no, it's, that's obviously less than online. So I mentioned the fact that online it was offering me £390 cash back for a Pixel 5 and the person in the store's face was, they looked a bit confused and shocked and were kind of a bit like, that seems awful high. Um, definitely maybe go and do that quickly online because that seems a bit weird. So yeah, unfortunately I couldn't get the offer in the store so I just got the 4.25% through top cash back instead plus 1% through Amex. But definitely if you're planning on buying a Samsung phone in a store, check out any sorts of reward cashback type credit cards you have because Samsung is quite often on there. But yeah, for this deal here, what I did is I traded in a Pixel 5, which gave £240. I used this voucher code S23BOOST, which gave an extra £150, bringing up to £390. I used 4.25% cashback through Top Cashback, and I got an additional 1% through my credit card. So yeah, that's how I got this phone for about £820, when its retail price is £1,249. And all I had to do was trade in an old Pixel 5 that was sitting in a drawer doing nothing. So there you go. That was a look at my new phone, the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. 
So hopefully you found that video interesting or useful. Obviously it's not my usual style of video, but I thought it'd be quite interesting to sort of show this and sort of show my perspective as an average phone user who just bought this to use as a normal phone and doesn't worship phones or collect them or really care too much about them. And yeah, I absolutely love this thing. Now, would I pay £1,249 for it? Probably not. Um, I think at that sort of price point, I would be inclined to either buy a second hand or just heavily discounted S22 Ultra, or I would wait a while and then buy this when the prices have dropped because the second hand ones have come onto the market or whatever. But given I can, I was able, I'm able to trade this phone in, which has literally been sitting in a drawer doing nothing because I couldn't be bothered selling it because it wasn't worth much, I can get rid of this phone and get this for £850 or £859 and then even less when I take into account cash back for the sort of £820 or so I've paid for this, I would say actually, yeah, it is worth that much. So yeah, very happy with it. So yeah, hopefully you found that interesting. I think the offer for trading it, for getting that extra £150 off the trade-in runs until the start of March, so you do have a bit of time if you are interested in doing that. And in terms of things like the cases, that the case, I've put a link in the description for that and the screen protectors and a link to the phone on the Samsung website, so you can take a look at that if you're interested in buying it. But yeah, thank you very much for watching.